Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good morning from America. Uh, I am uh, talking to you from uh, suburban Philadelphia. That's uh, my home. This is where I grew up. Uh, I have three kids. They uh, tease me. They say I've been sheltering in place all my life. So uh, this uh, pandemic has uh, not been very disruptive for me. I, I haven't moved. Um, uh, I will say, uh, if you've been following US, the U.S. elections, the state that put uh, Vice President Biden over the top, he's now President-elect Biden, was my home state of Pennsylvania. And uh, I live in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And these are the key battleground uh, areas in the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I, you know, based on my hard econometric work, uh, I've come to the conclusion that uh, my wife was the person who put Joe Biden over the top. I think it was her vote that actually won Pennsylvania for Biden, which means, of course, uh, given the Electoral College, the crazy system we have here, uh, he became the next president of the United States. Uh, uh, you know, uh, half joking there, but, uh, you know, roughly true. It's the uh, uh, suburban women uh, of Philadelphia that uh, drove this election. But anyway, uh, my task, Fiona has given me the job of giving you a sense of the outlook for uh, the global economy. Uh, my horizon here is going to be relatively near term, you know, because we are going to be talking about uh, the policies of President Biden. Uh, maybe we'll talk uh, out a little further uh, into his uh, term. But uh, given that we're in the middle of a pandemic and that's still top of mind, uh, the, near, the horizon here for the outlook is, uh, is near term. Uh, I'll begin with a, a description of my kind of baseline view of the world, where we're headed. The most likely scenario in the middle of the distribution of possible outcomes. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty here, uh, uh, more than typical. And so we'll talk about, I'll then turn and talk about the uh, risks to the outlook, uh, both positive and, of course, negative. Uh, we've gotten some, some more recent positive news. You know, yesterday's news from Pfizer about a very effective vaccine. Uh, that's a, a, a potential upside. So we'll talk about some upsides, but uh, obviously there's a lot of downside risk here. So that's my plan for the next uh, 25 minutes or so. And then I'll turn it back to uh, Fiona and the group uh, to see what kind of questions you might have. Okay, uh, so let's just uh, dive right in. Uh, I think this uh, first chart, hopefully everyone's got that, uh, nicely encapsulates uh, where the global economy has been and where I think we're headed. Uh, this is the, the uh, unemployment rate across the globe. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, based on our global model. We have, uh, well, I think, 110 countries in the model. So this is a weighted average of unemployment across those 110 countries. Uh, this is data, quarterly data, from uh, Q1 2018, as I said, through uh, the uh, uh, President Biden's for uh, next term through the end of 2024. Uh, you can see the recession. Uh, it was uh, short, um, you know, globally, February, March, April, three-month recession. Um, the typical uh, recession since World War II globally lasts about nine, ten months. So, uh, the short, a very short recession. Actually, the shortest in, I think, uh, in history, uh, but very severe. Uh, you can see the increase in unemployment uh, that uh, occurred. You know the the equilibrium full employment unemployment rate globally is around five and a half percent. Of course, that varies a lot from place to place. In the United States, the, the uh, full employment unemployment rate is probably closer to four, four and a half percent. In Europe, it's uh, probably closer to eight percent. So uh, a great deal of variation here. But globally, full employment is about a five and a half percent unemployment rate. Uh, you see, we, we got up to well over seven percent on a quarterly basis, so probably closer to eight uh, percent on a monthly basis, uh, very severe recession. Uh, just for context, uh, I'll give you another statistic, uh, a global GDP uh, peaked to trough uh, uh, between uh, February, March, April. Uh, that was down about 14%, real GDP down about 14% in, in that period. And again, just for a little bit of context, if you go back to the financial crisis, uh, which uh, occurred a little over a decade ago, the peak to trough decline in GDP was about 4%. So by that measure, uh, the pandemic recession uh, was uh, three times uh, more severe. So a very severe 
arguably the most severe uh, downturn we've experienced, uh, at least since uh, the start of the Great Depression back in the early 1930s. You can see we got a, a bit of a improvement uh, as businesses started to reopen in the spring into the summer. Uh, and uh, you can see you know, where we're headed here uh, between now and the middle of 2021. Um, the middle of 2021 is when I expect that there will be a, an effective vaccine or vaccines that are uh, reasonably widely adopted and um, uh, distributed. Uh, it's going to vary a lot across the globe and it's going to take a long time, I think, to get a vaccine out there broadly. Uh, but uh, in most of the, in the developed world, Europe, US, uh, parts of Asia, uh, we should have a vaccine that's, uh, at least in, our, in my baseline thinking, a vaccine that's uh, uh, pretty good and, and, uh, and out there uh, enough that it's making a difference in terms of uh, what's going on in, in our economy. Um, you know, this uh, probably overstates things. You know, I, I don't think uh, the pandemic ends as an event. It's not like one day we're in the pandemic, the next day we're not. It's, it's probably going to be more like a process. So maybe the better way of thinking about this is that if, when we reconvene at this conference a year from now, we're all going to feel a lot better about how things are going. We're going to feel a lot safer and uh, we're going to start uh, behaving more typically. Um, between now and uh, the, uh, that, uh, the end of the pandemic, though, you can see we, we continue to see some modest improvement in the, in the global economy, enough job growth to continue to push unemployment lower, but it's, it's, a, it's a modest improvement, slow improvement. I mean, you've got the cross uh, winds of, uh, of uh, the pandemic, which is still raging across the globe, uh, you know, obviously here in the United States and in Europe, less so in Asia, emerging world is grappling with the continued rise in infections. So the, the, that's a real headwind to uh, economic growth. Uh, and then we have the, the uh, tailwinds of policy, you know, very aggressive uh, monetary policy, policy from central banks, interest rates are at, z at the zero lower bound or negative in Europe and Japan. Uh, and uh, fiscal policymakers have uh, been using deficit financed uh, uh, spending, uh, government spending and tax cuts to try to stimulate economic growth. And um, so you've got those, those cross currents, those uh, hell, uh, tailwinds and headwinds. And the net of all that is an economy that continues to move forward, but uh, avoid going back into recession, but it's uh, going to be uh, tricky, uh, a, a bit uncomfortable here uh, until the pandemic is over again by this time next year. You can see on the other side of the pandemic, as we move into 2022, we're off and running. A lot of pent up demand, consumer demand, uh, you know, particularly for uh, various types of consumer services. People will want to tr travel, tourism will come back pretty quickly, I think. Uh, business travel will be slower to come back. Uh, may, we may, may never come back completely, but uh, tourism should come back over the, over the subsequent several years. Um, uh, Going out to restaurants, going to ball games, you know that kind of stuff, uh, drive a lot of growth. The other, the other thing that should help support uh, or juice up things on the other side of the pandemic is we've got to rebuild inventories. Uh, inventories have been drawn down uh, dramatically during the recession, and uh, while we're not we're not drawing down inventories any further at this point, we're not building them either. So very very lean inventory. Uh, and uh, as those inventories get rebuilt, as the global supply chain revs back up, uh, that should provide a lot of growth and juice, you know, in 2022. But you will notice uh, we don't get back to five and a half percent. That that's my, as I said, benchmark for full employment, the equilibrium fund, uh, the equilibrium uh, unemployment rate until uh, 2024. So this is not a so-called V-shaped recovery. It's going to take a while. To get back to where we were, uh, this is uh, going to be a bit of a slog. Um, you may be asking yourself, okay, if it's not a V-shaped, what is it? Uh, how would you describe what we're going to experience here? And I think uh, the best description, the most apt description I've heard, which is now kind of in the popular uh, debate and discussion, is the K-shaped uh, recovery. So big decline in the recession, we got a bounce, came kind of sort of halfway back. And now, uh, depending on which group you're part of the economy you're in, which industry you're in, uh, which company you're in, 
you know, with, with sector, you're either doing really, really well, you're navigating through nicely, that's the uh, part of the K, or you're, you're not, you're, you're really struggling here, you're suffering unemployment, uh, you're, you're, you're losing market share, you know, things aren't going all that well, that's the other part of the K. So these very divergent kind of paths here for different parts of the economy. Yeah, that's most obvious uh, looking across income group. I mean, uh, lower income uh, households uh, with less net worth, uh, folks with lesser skills and education, people are working in the accommodation industry, the retailing, uh, recreational activities, uh, transportation, obviously airlines, uh, healthcare sector, very severely disrupted, they are struggling. That's why unemployment is still so high. You know, it's still uh, at recession, uh, high recession levels. Uh, uh, others, uh, high income households, high net worth households of folks with less, of, of, with greater skills in education, good healthcare, you know, you and I, we can work from home, we can work from anywhere. Uh, we own a home, uh, we own stocks. So this run up in stock values, you know, feels really good. Uh, we're in pretty good shape. We've kind of navigated through. I mean, obviously, no no one's happy about what's going on, but we've financially been uh, we've not been hurt by this. Um, you can see it in real estate. You know, for example, I mean, the house, single family housing markets uh, doing quite well. Very low rates. Uh, credit's been remained relatively ample. It's tightened up a bit, but not to the degree that you might anticipate, given all the government support in different parts of the world. And then a shift in preferences, uh, very surprising, at least to me, uh, people aren't as interested uh, in uh, luxury rental living in big urban global gateway cities and have been buying property in suburbs, you know, single family rental home ownership uh, properties in suburbs, exurbs and uh, smaller cities and towns. So that's really uh, juiced things up. So that, that part of the real estate market, no problem. Commercial real estate, a totally different story. That's the other part of the K. You know, obviously work from anywhere, not a, not a very positive development for uh, the office market. I mean, just give you a sense of that here in the United States, prior to the pandemic, a little under 10% of the workforce was working from home on a consistent basis. During the teeth of the business shutdowns back in uh, March and April, about a third, a little over a third of the workforce was working from home. We're now down to about 20%, and I think that's where we stabilize and start to rise again as people uh, empower the work from anywhere uh, kind of dynamic. And obviously pretty tough for the office market. Uh, I mentioned business travel not coming back. That's gonna be hard for the hotel accommodation industry and properties uh, in, in the most obvious retail getting hammered by brick and mortar retailer getting hammered by online. That was happening obviously before the pandemic, but that has gotten very supercharged uh, during the pandemic. Uh, even I mentioned single family housing, the, in the, the high end apartment market uh, that, that that's getting hurt. So uh, commercial real estate, I think is the uh, uh, kind of on the downside of the K uh, where a single family is. Uh, I can go on and on about this, but that gives you a pretty good sense of uh, what I expect. Uh, yeah, you know, going forward, forward here. That, so that that's the baseline outlook. Uh, that's the most likely scenario. I will say, I do think, uh, at, you know, between now and mid next year, uh, between now and the end of the pandemic, uh, the risks are skewed to the downside, uh, and uh, in large part and significant part, most fundamentally, because sentiment is still very, very fragile. If you look at consumer sentiment surveys across the globe, they're well below pre-pandemic levels. And what I'm showing you here is our survey, our global survey of businesses. Uh, it's a business sentiment survey. We ask a, a, a range of questions to clients off of uh, one of our websites, Economic View, uh, every week. And we've been doing it since 2003. I'm showing you the res uh, responses to three of the questions in that survey. Uh, uh, investing, that's the blue line, hiring, green line, and raising prices, that's the orange line. So this shows the percent of respondents that say they're investing, hiring, or raising prices. And you can see we've seen some recovery in recent weeks, particularly with regard to investing. But even with investing, the blue line, you can see we're, we're only now back to kind of the low points back in the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Uh, look at uh, hiring, still very, very depressed. And then most significantly, uh, prices. Uh, this has been a very severe, the pandemic has been a very significant 
uh, disinflationary shock. In fact, there was a few weeks, a month or two ago, when not a single respondent to our survey said they were raising prices, which, as you can see, was completely unprecedented. So, you know, I do think inflationary pressures will develop on the other side of the pandemic, and we can talk about that. But on this side of the pandemic, uh, very serious disinflationary event. So, you know, I think the point of this uh, chart uh, is that uh, the collective psyche remains very, very fragile. And uh, that means if anything else kind of goes wrong, if things don't kind of sort of stick to script, if we don't get announcements like we got yesterday from Pfizer about their vaccine, uh, we got a problem. Uh, the risks are skewed to the downside. Okay. Now, let me turn more explicitly uh, to the risks. You know, what uh, could happen that would result in a, a weaker economy than I'm anticipating or a stronger one? And let me I'll mention a handful of risks and then I'll call it quits and again, turn it back to you and see if you have any questions you'd like me to address. Uh, the first is the pandemic itself. Uh, and there's both upside and downside risk here. I mean, obviously, with the infections intensifying, the pandemic intensifying across the globe, that is a clear downside risk. And that's the point of this chart. Maybe, fortunately, this may be a chart only an economist can love, but, it, uh, but I'll explain it. The x-axis, the horizontal axis, is the number of in, uh, confirmed infections per million inhabitants in the countries that are shown here. This is a scatter plot for countries. Uh, the y-axis, the vertical axis, is the change in the uh, jobless rate, the unemployment rate, between August and September, depending on date availability, uh, uh, compared to the fourth quarter of 2019. I picked that because that's pre-pandemic, and the global economy was pretty close to full employment at, point, at that point in time. I'm not cherry-picking here. Uh, I'm showing you every country for which we have data that uh, is available for August and September. That line, that blue line that uh, it cuts across the scatter plot. That is a regression line. Uh, nothing fancy here. This is PowerPoint puts it in there for you. And you can see there the regression statistics in R squared of 0.51. That's a pretty high R squared. I mean, that, that means it's a pretty good fit. I'm fitting those data points very closely with a very simplistic linear regression line. Uh, you know, this probably overstates the case a bit because it doesn't control for the policy response. So it's you know, one dimensional. So I don't wanna overstate the case here, but it's obviously making a pretty strong case that when you have more infections, the pandemic is intensifying, that is a problem for the economy. You can see the coefficient on uh, in the uh, X variable, that's infections per million in, uh, inhabitants. Let me interpret that for you in the context of the United States, because I just know that best. So if you go back, say four, six, eight weeks ago, the US was suffering, say, you know, 40,000 confirmed infections per day. If you've looked recently, we're, let's say we're over 100,000, but just to make the arithmetic easier, let's say we're gonna settle in around 100,000 here. We're gonna stay here for the next four, six, eight, 12 weeks. If this regression line continues to hold, so if the history of the pandemic continues to hold going forward, given that increase in confirmed infections from 40 to 100K per day, uh, uh, that means the U.S. unemployment rate is going to rise by more than one percentage point. That means we're going to lose jobs. So we're going to go from creating jobs to losing jobs. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, I think, this kind of the same dynamic we can expect to experience in Europe. I mean, already the European economy is starting to struggle with the increased infections there and the shutdowns that are occurring and the, and the pullback and uh, the, the stricter social distancing rules, that kind of thing. Uh, even, if you, even if governments don't impose those kinds of restrictions, I think you know, uh, it has an economic consequence because consumers, business people, they just get nervous about what's going on and you know, uh, they have to pull back, no, no other choice. They can get more con ca cautious in their spending, investing and hiring. So in my baseline scenario, I have been assuming that uh, yes, we'll get some increase in infections, but it's not going to result in significant economic fallout. And I'll have to say at this point, I say that with a great deal of interpretation. I think the risks here are pretty significant to the downside. Now, having said that, the upside here is we're going to get a vaccine therapy, other mitigation efforts that work better sooner than I'm anticipating. Remember in the baseline, I said, you know, uh, it's kind of mid next year in 2021 we'll, when we'll start feeling really good about things. Uh, you know, given recent announcements and progress here uh, among the pharmaceuticals across the globe, 
uh, that may work out better than I'm anticipating, uh, and uh, obviously uh, to everyone's benefit. I, you know, I don't I don't think it means much for the economy in the next, say, three, four or five months. But you know, you know, maybe we get uh, uh, what we need, you know, by spring of 2021 as opposed to the summer of 2021, uh, which would make a difference, you know, in terms of global economic growth. So uh, risk number one uh, is the is, is the obvious, the pandemic itself. Risk number two is monetary policy. And here I'll have to say global central banks have done a uh, excellent job in responding to the uh, pandemic, to the crisis. Um, the Fed, uh, Federal Reserve obviously leading the way, dropping uh, interest rates. Uh, you can see uh, the federal funds rate target uh, went from well, went to zero, went to the zero lower bound pretty quickly back in uh, when the pandemic hit in March. Uh, lowering capital reserve liquidity requirements for, uh, for global banks, uh, that been helpful in uh, uh, facilitating the flow of credit into the economy, which has been uh, very, very key. Uh, and uh, in the case of the US, probably the most important, uh, oh, I should also mention obviously the quantitative easing of different stripes in different parts of the world buying bonds uh, to keep uh, rates, long-term rates down has also been very important. And then various credit facilities uh, have been established to uh, uh, help the funding markets continue to allow for the flow of credit. And here in the US, uh, I think there's 12 or 13 different facilities that have been stood up you know, for the commercial paper market, the asset-backed securities market, the municipal bond market, the corporate debt markets, money market funds, I mean, I can uh, repo markets, I can go on and on and on. And they've been very, very effective in insulating the global financial system from the chaos that's occurring in the, in the real economy. By the way, that's probably the most significant difference between uh, the pandemic recession and the financial crisis. As you recall, in the financial crisis, the problems in the economy uh, bled into the financial system, caused it to collapse and require substantial government support. And it took a long, long time for the financial system to recapitalize, reliquify, and get back up and running. And that really delayed any economic recovery and uh, slowed the subsequent uh, economic expansion. Uh, here, so far, we've been fortunate that central banks have responded quickly enough and aggressively enough that they've been able to forestall that kind of scenario. And that augurs well for coming out of the pandemic uh, on the other side of the pandemic. The other thing, uh, obviously, uh, the reduction in low, uh, rate, uh, the aggressive monetary response has been is to raise asset prices. I've been talking about housing values, but also uh, equity prices. And you can see here the Wilshire 5000. This is the value of all publicly traded stocks in the U.S. This doesn't include the last couple of days, which uh, makes the picture even look uh, even more striking. But we there are lots of reasons why the equity markets have come back. But uh, most fundamentally is this low rate environment that uh, we're in right now. So uh, that's obviously also helped to lift uh, uh, sentiment, uh, business uh, support, business investment, hiring. Uh, there are wealth effects in the UK and the US that are uh, particularly important. High income households, high net worth households benefit from this. So the Fed's uh, uh, response to this has been, and the central banks globally response to this has been very, very good. Not a lot of risk here that central banks are going to take their foot off the accelerator. I mean, ECB pre-announced some further easing in policy already. Uh, the Fed won't be too far behind if things don't stick to roughly to script. Uh, I do worry a little bit, though, about what would happen if things don't stick to script. If, the, for whatever reason, the economy starts to weaken again, you know, maybe the pandemic, going back to my the earlier risk around the pandemic, that the intensifying pandemic causes businesses to pull back more aggressively and the economy starts to struggle. Then the question quickly becomes, well, what more can central banks do? And the, ans the answer is not obvious. Uh, it's all, everything else, every, every other option that central banks now have going forward are pretty much on the margin. So, uh, and, that, and that's why you're hearing central bankers, you know, uh, 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 recommend strongly to lawmakers in their countries that we they need to provide additional fiscal support to try to keep the economy moving forward. But but that is the risk here, that you know, if things don't stick to script and the economy does weaken, uh, that central banks can't really respond in an effective way. And uh, you know, uh, that, that'll add to any uh, downside scenario. 
A third risk uh, is fiscal policy, uh, you know, government tax and spending policy. And again, here I'll say that uh, governments across the globe have been uh, good at uh, providing support to their economies, deficit finance, uh, increases in spending and cuts in taxes. Uh, this gives you a sense of the magnitude of that fiscal support uh, uh, across the globe as a percent of 2019 GDP, obviously pre-pandemic. Uh, you can see Australia is leading the way uh, with fiscal support. This does not include the monetary support. It doesn't include the effects of, uh, or, or the, uh, uh, the resources going to uh, providing uh, credit facilities or other sources of support to uh, credit flows. This is only a discretionary government, increases in government spending and tax cuts that are deficit financed. And you can see Australia 13, 14% of GDP, US close to 12%. Uh, you know, uh, every economy on the planet, uh, every country on the planet has been uh, following the same policy prescription here to provide support to their economies to try to get to the other side of the pandemic. In Europe, uh, the, the, the most significant sources of fiscal support have come through what I call various labor market wage subsidy programs to help businesses continue to maintain their payrolls, uh, not lay off workers, try to keep those workers on payrolls. Uh, and uh, most European countries are continuing on with those uh, sources of support. And that's uh, uh, obviously going to be very positive, very important here as infections in, in Europe continue to intensify. Of course, the risk here is that uh, governments, uh, uh, lawmakers in different parts of the world kind of lose faith and uh, uh, take their foot off the fiscal accelerator too quickly. They go from providing fiscal support, fiscal stimulus to fiscal austerity. And in fact, that is the mistake that many governments, particularly the United States, did back in the wake of the financial crisis. We went from fiscal support to fiscal austerity much too quickly. Uh, I, I, you know, presumably we learned a lesson from that, but uh, you, you know, there is uh, a, the, a real risk here that, that uh, uh, governments don't continue uh, to provide the kind of support is necessary as long as the pandemic is raging. This is particularly important here in the United States, a lot of debate around another fiscal rescue package. I had thought that that would occur before the election, but obviously it did not. And I'm still counting on one uh, when uh, on the other side of President Vice President Biden's inauguration, but um, you know that's not a done deal. And if we don't get that, I think that's a significant risk to the near-term uh, economic outlook. So very, very important. Which gets to a fifth risk, and that is, uh, and again, when I say risk, both upside and downside, you know, what does the new president in the United States mean for the economy, uh, global economy? And to give you a sense of that, uh, I've identified. A, a number of key uh, policies uh, and behaviors uh, that we've been debating here in the US prior to the election and how President Biden would, I think, uh, address these issues, rank ordered from uh, those issues with which he has the greatest difference uh, in policy with, with, uh, tr with President Trump. So where you could see the most significant reversals or changes in a potential policy or behavior. You know, at the top, very top is the most obvious governing. Uh, President Biden will re-strengthen uh, institutions, NATO, WTO, IMF, World Bank, Federal Reserve Board. Uh, President Trump was actively working to uh, undermine those institutions. So very different perspective. Uh, the response to COVID-19, uh, Trump uh, left it up, uh, pretty, pretty much ceded any uh, federal response, left it up to local state governments that took, took a patchwork approach to addressing the pandemic. And obviously, given what's going on here, that did not work. Uh, infections are rising. Immigration, uh, th this is very important to uh, many countries uh, that where immigrants come into the US. Uh, Trump had a very restrictive immigration policy. Biden will have a uh, will normalize immigration policy uh, very quickly. So we'll start to see immigration flows from uh, Mexico, uh, Central America, Latin America, uh, parts of Asia pick up. I think uh, uh, throughout the uh, Biden administration, very different perspective on climate change, energy policy. He's, uh, Biden is going to reengage on the climate, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, something that Trump. 
uh, I think that might have been his second or third executive order was uh, pulling away from from Paris. Very different perspective on health care, taxes, gun control. You know, obviously, it does look that like the U.S. is going to have a divided government, Republican Senate, Democratic House, which limits the ability of uh, Biden to implement significant changes to policy, particularly tax and spending policy. But he can use uh, executive orders, much like Trump did, on trade and immigration and regulation uh, without uh, uh, any buy-in from Congress. So I do think we're going to see some big changes in uh, not only immigration policy, which I mentioned, but also for the important for the global economy, trade policy. I do not think Biden is going to continue on with Trump's uh, tariff wars, which have been very disruptive to the global economy, caused the global economy to slow even prior to the pandemic. Uh, I think he'll uh, stand down, uh, particularly with regard to tariffs on our on U.S. allies. Uh, Europe, Canada, Brazil, uh, Korea. Uh, I, I, th I don't know that he'll pull back on his tariffs with China quickly. He'll probably use them as a source of negotiating leverage to get the Chinese to uh, play by the rules, uh, play more by the rules. But uh, but uh, but I, I don't think he's going to raise them. The other thing is I think uh, he'll uh, take a more multilateral approach in dealing with China, try to get other allies to team up with the US to get China to change some of their behaviors. And also he's talked about rejoining a refashioned Trans-Pacific Partnership deal. That's the free trade deal between the US and other Pacific Rim nations uh, that excluded China because they uh, were thought not to play fair and they wouldn't be included until they did. And that seems like a good way of, of uh, approaching all this. So bottom line, uh, oh, you will notice there are some policies at the bottom of the list here that uh, where Biden and Trump uh, were more consistent with each other. For example, there are perspectives on technology, the big tech companies. I mean, the Department of Justice under Trump sued Google for antitrust. You could easily see that happening with Biden. And they both are uh, very willing to run up deficits, particularly when you have a zero interest rate environment. Uh, so I don't think there's much of a difference there. but. Uh, but, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, I think you can count on uh, very significant differences in policy going forward, uh, Biden versus Trump. But obviously, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, paths we can go down here, depending on how the election plays out uh, over the course of the next few weeks. It's still, you know, not over yet, particularly deciding who's going to run the Senate. Uh, and uh, also on the other side, exactly what uh, President Biden does will make a, a big difference. So a lot of risk around this. Finally, and, and I'll, then I'll call it quits. I do want to call attention to one other risk, uh, which is, uh, you know, the uh, dark side of uh, the fiscal policy response to the pandemic. Uh, uh, countries across the globe have been very aggressive in deficit finance fiscal policy. And that is going to create an issue at some point down the road on the other side of the pandemic, probably when the economy, global economy is approaching full employment in 2023 or 2024 and interest rates start to rise. To give you a sense of that risk is this chart of this, this uh, bubble chart. The x-axis horizontal axis is uh, so the sovereign debt to GDP ratio for the countries that are shown. The y-axis, the vertical axis, is the difference between the actual sovereign debt to GDP ratio and that debt to GDP ratio above which investors in that debt begin to lose faith that they're going to get paid in a timely way. They require a higher interest rate to get compensated. That adds to the interest expense of the government and deficits and debt rise. You can see how you get into kind of a self-reinforcing negative cycle. Those countries with no fiscal space, they're on the zero line. Uh, they, they are uh, pretty much right on the border of that self-reinforcing negative cycle. Russia, Turkey, Mexico, South Africa, Egypt, Argentina, Italy, Greece. You can see even though France and Spain, you know, they're getting, they're closing in on uh, the, that, uh, that the zero fiscal space line. Even the US, this is pre any additional fiscal support we get that big blue uh, bubble that's moving down. And uh, ultimately, uh, I do think investors are gonna question, you know, how much debt is outstanding. And uh, we will have, uh, 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 there, will, there will be a, uh, a, 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 some kind of, of sovereign debt event. I, I hesitate to go so far as calling it a crisis, 
but sovereign debt event where uh, interest rates rise to a significant degree uh, and put pressure on uh, on the economy and uh, just another risk to consider, uh, not near term, uh, a little further down the road, but something to put on the radar screen. Uh, and I will end with the, the following, uh, you know, to me, the biggest surprise in the wake of the financial crisis and that long expansion after the financial crisis was how low interest rates and inflation remained throughout that period. Uh, I suspect the biggest surprise on the other side of the pandemic is going to be how high inflation and interest rates are. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you to ask a question as to you know why uh, that might be the case if you're interested. I, uh, hopefully I didn't take too much time there. Uh, hopefully I stuck reasonably to script. I was getting a little verbose, so I might take a little bit more time, but I'll turn it back to you and see uh, where the group wants to take the conversation. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, we have a few questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to ask you to put your medical hat on, first of all. Um, the first question we have is, whilst the news regarding a potential COVID-19 vaccine is being viewed as positive, is the positivity being overstated given that there's no vaccine for other types of coronavirus, for example, SARS, and even though inf influenza vaccine is between 45 to 60 percent effectiveness? Sorry about that. That's my my dog. You know, she's like 15 and is half blind, can't hear. It's probably stuck somewhere. So I know she was trying to answer the question, but I'll I'll let you I'll let you take this one. So 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 Fiona, so the question is is I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Is the uh, positive news from Pfizer regarding a vaccine yeah. being overstated, given that we don't know oh. the effectiveness. Oh, of I see. Well, let me put it this way: uh, my forecast, my outlook for the economy, did not change yesterday because of the Pfizer news. Uh, you know. I have been expecting we'd get some kind of vaccine, effective vaccine or vaccines widely distributed by mid next year. That remains the case. I think though, uh, what yesterday's news did was it, it took away the tail, some of the tail risk. So, you know, now we've all been expecting this. We've been expecting good news. We finally got some good news. That's consistent with everyone's thinking, great. Uh, is it proof positive? Absolutely not. You know, we've had, you know, as you mentioned, SARS and other cases where it hasn't all worked, it hasn't really worked out. But, you know, this is good news, consistent with the idea in the baseline view that we're going to get something that's going to work reasonably well by middle of next year. Takes away the some of the tail risk, and that's why equity prices have risen to the degree they have. I, I don't think anyone's forecast has changed. It's probably, maybe somebody's has, but I don't think that's what it's about. It's about, you know, reducing some of that, you know, downside risk that we all were, you know, fearful of uh, on the other on the other side of the, of the news. The other thing is, it's not just Pfizer. You know, we are getting you know, better news from you know Moderna and a number of the other pharmaceuticals. It's not only about vaccines; it's about therapies. I don't know if you noticed, FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration here, just gave approval to uh, a therapy. It seems to be working pretty well. And it's about mitigation efforts. We're getting, I do think we are getting better at, you know, mitigating uh, the fallout uh, and the, most importantly, from, a, from an economic perspective, the economic fallout. So I think we can take some solace in the Pfizer news, but no, I, you know, I, I don't think I'd go out and change any of my forecast because of what we heard yesterday. It's just consistent with the forecast that, you know, most of, most of us have, have, have put into place. Okay, great. Um, question from a, a participant in Germany um, about the VAT tax cut that has been reduced from 19 to 16%. They're asking if you think the measure had an impact or was it a PR stunt? Both. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's in PR. I wouldn't discount the importance of PR, you know, in a pandemic. I mean, at the end of the day, the, the response by government is most critical benefit from the response from government to an economy is shoring up confidence. It's, it's telling people, I got your back. Uh, you know, collectively, uh, we've got your back. And you know, uh, once people get that message and understand that, it goes a long way 
to ensuring that a crisis doesn't turn into a complete catastrophe. So, you know, things like cutting the VAT, you know, the dollars and cents may not be what's important here. It's just part of a broader package of efforts to say to people, you know, we're, we understand what's going on. We know you're hurting and we're gonna do whatever we can to help you and uh, we stand you know, behind you. And I think that's, that's absolutely you know, critical uh, to all of this. But I, you know, uh, the dollars and cents do matter. Uh, and I think you know, that, that's important. Uh, and it, you know, if that's the only thing that was going on here, uh, you know, that, that would be inadequate, but you know, this uh, is part of a package of things that's being done to, to address the, uh, the uh, fallout from the pandemic. So the answer is it's both, but nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, I think both are important. Great. Um, one more question from the audience. Um, was this the recession that boom and bust economies usually see every six to 10 years? Or do you think it's more likely that we'll have another recession within two to two to three years or beyond that even? That's a great question. Um, my, my sense is that, uh, that this is not the kind of therapeutic, and I use that word guardedly, therapeutic kind of recessions that we've had historically. When I say therapeutic, what I mean by that is that recessions tend to ring out excesses, you know, uh, overborrowing, speculation, um, in the housing market and commercial real estate market, uh, uh, over, uh, over uh, extending credit, uh, uh, overly extending credit, e uh, e too easy underwriting standards, uh, those kinds of excesses. So, you know, usually in the, in the good times, we kind of lose our minds and we start taking on these risks and taking on too much debt. And the re subsequent recession rings out those excesses. It's painful. You know, you, you go through delinquency and default and foreclosure and repossession and the banks suffer and you know everyone loses financially asset prices come down but it's there's a therapeutic element to it you know and, and then generally governments respond to that whatever caused that recession and improve the economy and the system going forward so you know we had the financial crisis on the other side of the financial crisis governments imposed you know, uh, uh, implemented significant changes to uh, regulatory policy. Uh, banks needed to hold more capital. They need to have uh, more liquidity. Uh, there was more, there was stress testing, more oversight, more risk management. Uh, you know, we just recently had changes in accounting standards on loss provisioning, which you could kind of trace back to what the lessons we learned in the financial crisis, you know, IFRS 9 and CECL, that kind of thing. Uh, so we tend to learn, you know, from the recession and we make changes which makes our system better, I think. Uh, you know, obviously doesn't solve all our problems, it only solves the one, the one that we just went through, but you know, at least we're moving in the right direction. Um, this, this one may be different, right? In the sense that it's causing us to leverage up even more, right? So I mentioned it in the context of sovereign debt um, also in, in terms of corporate debt, right? I mean, uh, because of what the central banks have done, you know, and I think rightly so to ensure that credit continues to flow. But what that means is leverage is continuing to rise and maybe with to companies that may not really have the same business model on the other side of that. I mean, I keep thinking of Carnival Cruises, right? Carnival Cruises, big, you know, ship, uh, luxury line, you know, is that their business model probably has changed, right? But they, in, in a more, if, if, if the Fed hadn't stepped in and allowed them to issue bonds, they would have gone belly up and they would have had to drastically change their capacity and what they do. But because they could go out and issue bonds at five or 6%, pretty high in the context of zero short-term rates, but they still could borrow, you know, their business model hasn't changed. So, we're not going through this kind of therapeutic kind of process that we normally go through. In fact, we're, we may be exacerbating, and, and also we, uh, uh, central banks have used up all their resources, right? I mean, as I said, there's no more 
what else are they going to do? You know, we're at zero lower bound. We're at, I don't know what, we're negative 40, 50 basis points in Europe, in parts of Europe. So, I mean, there's this, what are you going to do? So, no, I, I, I sense that, that we are actually more vulnerable on the other side of this one, uh, not in a better place. So the next recession isn't going to be 10 years from now. I, I, you know, if you invite me back, Fiona, next year, I'm going to tell you the exact date of the next recession. Just like I told you the exact date of this recession. I don't know if anyone was listening to me, but I said summer 2020. I know there are people out there who know this. Go, go Google it. I didn't, I didn't predict the pandemic, obviously, but you know, I felt that the excesses in the economy were developing to the point where it was very vulnerable in, in mid-2020. In fact, I, I actually had a date, you know, exact, exact day. I, I missed it by a few days, but you know, a few days. So if you invite me back next year, I'm going to tell you the exact date of the next recession. And, it, I, and I'm going to tease you with, it's, it's not 10 years from now. It's a lot, it's a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. We will, we will definitely hold you to that. Um, I've got a question here about whether if the US election had gone the other way and Trump had uh, succeeded in his bid to be reelected, whether you would be telling us a different story right now. Oh, oh man. That's at, someone asked that who knows me quite well, I'm sure. Who asked that? <laughs> it uh, may have come from a Bureau Van Dyke colleague. Oh, yeah. oh okay, that makes sense. That makes, that makes sense. I don't know if you know this, but you know, four years ago when it was Clinton v. Trump, I was in I was in Europe on election night, and uh, I was with my wife and my son, and because I have a daughter in London, and we were all visiting, and I went to bed thinking Clinton had won, you know, the election, and my, I had a speech the next day. Next morning, I had a speech in London, you know, to our clients. So I don't know, 300 people in a hotel in London. And obviously I had all around Clinton, Clinton, Clinton. This was Clinton, Clinton's gonna do this, Clinton's gonna do that kind of thing. I get a call, I literally must've been, it probably was like four or five in the morning London time, cause that'd be midnight East Coast time, US. <clears throat> it was my other daughter, I have a daughter her back in the US. She was crying hysterically. And I, you know, I, I couldn't figure out what in the world was going on. I, you know, I, I, I couldn't connect the dots back to the election. I thought, you know, someone had died, you know, kind of thing. I go, honey, what's going on? And he goes, she goes, he won. I go, what are you talking about? He went, what are you talking about? I'm, you know, I still hadn't connected the dots. She says, turn on the TV. By the way, I can't stand BBC. I love BBC, but I <laughs> BBC's coverage of American politics, it, you know, give me American TV, but I had to watch BBC. And yeah, of course, Trump won. And I tell you, the next day I was a wreck. I was a wreck. So uh, that now with that as a preface to answering your question, maybe, yeah, it would have been different. Uh, I think we would have gone down a different path in a much darker path, to tell you the truth. You know, just think about trade, think about you know, immigration, think about climate change, you know, think about financial system. I, yeah, it would have been a different talk. Uh, um, in fact, if you're interested, I'll end this way. I wrote a paper, uh, you can Google it, Zandi Trump v. Biden. And the paper goes through, using our global model, goes through what the economic consequence would be of different election outcomes. And one of those election outcomes was Trump, you know, obviously Trump wins with a split Congress, Trump wins with a with a Republican sweep. So you take a look. Uh, it's an open, I'm an open book. All the assumptions are laid bare. You know, you can make your own assessment, your own judgment. Yeah, the answer is yes, it would make it make a difference. Yep, absolutely. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And um, we have a question. Someone is asking, could you please give some comments? on the likely impact of the Great Reset being put forward by the World Economic Forum? Uh, frankly, I don't know what that is. Uh, the Great Reset by the World Economic Forum? I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I should know probably, but I don't. Yeah. I'm afraid I can't fill you in on that either. Okay. So yeah, I don't know. The it's called the Great Reset? The, you know, the Great Reset by the World Economic Forum? I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, Somebody is asking about inflation. Where can you see inflation rises coming from? 
Yeah, so here I, I ended with the teaser. I was hoping someone would ask a question about inflation. You know, my uh, sense is, and I, let me put it, let me first say, in my baseline outlook, kind of the, again in the middle of distribution, I have inflation, uh, and I'm using the U.S. as a benchmark here, but it, you know this would be consistent across the globe. But the U.S. Uh, going above the Federal Reserve's target in a consistent way. The Federal Reserve's target, like in many other parts of the world, developed world, is, is about 2% inflation. The Fed has changed its monetary policy framework uh, and now has said that it would like to have inflation above that 2% in target for a, 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 an extended period of time so that on average, over the business cycle, inflation averages about 2%. And you know, if you kind of think about it, you need to do that to make sure that inflation expectations are at 2%. If you don't do that, if you're if the 2% is a ceiling, that means in recessions are going to be below the ceiling, and therefore inflation expectations are going to be below 2%. You'll never get to 2%. So it's almost arithmetic that you've got to do this. So, but anyway, they, they decided to do this. So that's my baseline. We go above 2%, and then we come back into 2%, very graceful, orderly, you know, uh, baseline. I think the risks are that we end up with higher rates of inflation than that in a more persistent way. And when I say that, I'm not saying four or 5% inflation, I'm saying 3% inflation, you know, something like that. And the re one of the reasons is the change in monetary policy. It's very difficult to uh, kind of get above 2% and just gracefully manage it and get it right back down to two and everything works out, sticks to script. It's a very uh, narrow th uh, thread, what do you call it? hole to, to, to put a thread through, a needle, a needle hole to put a thread through. So I, I think that with the Fed stepping on the accelerator, obviously every central bank on the planet stepping flat on the accelerator and scared to death to get into kind of a Japanese-like situation, that argues that we are going to get above target inflation and maybe more than even what the central banks want. Second uh, fact is I do think one of the results of the pandemic is that it's concentrating market share into certain companies across lots of industries. Uh, this was a dynamic that was in play before the pandemic, but the pandemic has supercharged it just like it has online retailing. Take the retail sector. You know, you're going to retail, a lot of mom and pop retailers are going belly up, failing. Even some mid-sized retailers are going bankrupt. And the big guys are are gaining market share. You know, they're, 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 that goes back to that K economy. You know, you, even within industries, you have winners and you have losers. And so if you have more winners and more concentrated market share across lots of industries, stands to reason on the other side of the pandemic when demand picks up in, in, in a consistent, earnest way, that those companies are gonna use that market power and raise prices more aggressively. And I suspect that's another reason to think, you know, inflation will be above target. Finally, one other thing I'll point out is in a lot of different markets, particularly commodity product markets, take the oil market as the best example, there's a rationalization of the supply side of the market, you know, oil, fracking, at these prices, you can't make money. Saudi, Russia, Canada, oil producers are pulling back on production, fracking in the US coming down. Once you see a pickup in demand, it conflates with that redu reduction in supply and you get these price spikes. So if you told me oil, Right now, Brent is going for, I think, 40 bucks a barrel. You know, if you told me a year from now, maybe a year and a half from now, it's going for 80 bucks a barrel, I say, that sounds about right to me. Uh, again, that's not my baseline, but that is a definite risk. And that's a relative price shift, but that relative price shift can get embedded into the wage price dynamics pretty quickly when you've got central banks flat foot flat on the accelerator. So my bottom line point here is, I do think the risks are skewed to higher rates of inflation. And the big surprise on the other side of the pandemic might be how high inflation is, and not how low it was as it was after the financial crisis, which, which by the way, you know, obviously inflation is a key building block to interest rates. Uh, so I would also expect higher rates of interest, both, both inflation and real interest rates on the other side of the pandemic uh, than people are anticipating. So that's, I think, a, a longer term risk to the outlook. Thank you very much. Um, we unfortunately don't have any more time for questions. Um, we're almost at the hour and I, uh, Andrea Blackman is on at four. So I uh, better wrap up before. Oh, you better. You better she's, she's great. Hey, uh, 
if people want, you can send me the questions. I'll respond in writing, and you That's can. That's very kind. Thank everybody. you, everybody. So happy to yeah, do absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, thanks if for you having want me. To um, send Mark questions, we can collate those for you. So if you want to add those to the chat area in the event pl platform, um, we can collate those and share those with Mark and, and get the answers back to you. But we really appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark. Fiona, one last word. One last thing. Yeah. Cool. Just, a, just a cautionary note. I strive to be 51% right to saying 51%. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we will see you this time next year, I hope. Take care. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.